Okay, chapter 12, uh, definitely one of the most unique calc chapters you're ever going to study, definitely the longest as well. We must begin this unit talking about sequences. Now, the cool thing about this is that you've been seeing sequences for a very, very long time. Uh, for example, I could give you a sequence such as 8, 16, and then we could say 32. And, you know, sometimes you'd say, oh, I wonder what the next number in that pattern would be. And in which case you'd say that it appears to be 64. It, you, you might see this in just, you know, logic kind of uh, questions and so forth. Uh, but, of course, we're really going to jump on in today and for the rest of this unit and uh, start developing sequences in a much more rigorous way. Let's read here a sequence, and it's implied that this will be an infinite sequence, that it, it can extend forever, is often denoted by a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3. In other words, when you see that a sub 3, it means it's the third term in the pattern, the third term. And, you know, then in general, you could say, well, here's an a sub n. So a sub 1 is the first term. I'm sorry for that typo, if you could correct it like I've handwritten it. a sub 1 is the first term, and, and so on. Well, in a more mathematically defined sense, a sequence is a function. One input, one output. The input will be considered the term number. You might say, oh, I wonder what the tenth term is. That would be like your independent variable. The output would be the actual tenth term itself. Uh, so you can see down here is kind of like an x value of 1, 2, 3, you know, like your third term and so forth. The actual number would be considered like a y value, like an output, right? Uh, so here we have a function, and then you can see what I was talking about before. You can actually list ordered pairs. Now, generally, we don't do that. We usually write our sequence like we did at the top of the screen right here. But in case we'd like to graph it, and sometimes we will, uh, this new point notation could be very, very helpful. So let's begin. And by the way, some of your homework questions, wonderfully, at least for today, are going to be, hey, can you generate some terms here? So uh, when they're doing that, we don't have to list ordered pairs. It says list the first four terms. And we could say, well, a sub 1 means your first term. That's implied n would equal 1. So here's your uh, you know, little uh, formula. And by the way, this formula is considered explicit. It's explicit in the sense that whatever term number you would like, it's right there for the taking. You could let n equal 10 or n equal 7, whatever you'd like, and you could get your answer very quickly. So let's do that with n equals 1. Well, what would we get here? This would be 3 plus, well, 1 half to the 1. 1 half to the 1 is just a half. I guess we'd get three and a half, or, or three point, you know, five, if you'd like. Second term, we'd say three plus one half squared. We all know that one half squared is one fourth. You'd get that. A sub three, the third term in this pattern. Well, we'd say uh, this is one half to the third. One half to the third is actually one eighth. And then we could come down here, a sub 4, fourth term here, 3 plus 1 half to the fourth. 1 half to the fourth is actually 1 16. And then they're actually having us take a jump. I wonder what the tenth term is. Well, that's 3 plus 1 half to the tenth. Well, 2 to the tenth is um, 1,024, right? Wow, look at that. And there you have it. Uh, that would be your uh, term, your tenth term in that pattern. So hopefully not so bad. 
you know, they're just saying, you know, it, you, could you list out what's happening? And sometimes you can see a pattern and, and you can say, well, you always have a three. What's happening to this fraction though? This fraction appears to be getting very small, right? Say, wow, if I kept going, I imagine that fraction would get smaller. Indeed, it would. And we will be investigating that, talking about where we're headed as we go to infinity, as n approaches infinity. But we'll get to that soon enough. Uh, look, here's another explicit formula. You could say, well, uh, look at this. I could very simply just begin to plug in a n equals 1. And 1 minus 1, you'd say, well, it's 0. 0 divided by 1, you'd say, that's 0. Yes, that doesn't mean all of your terms are zero. We're quickly going to see that. Look at this, negative one squared. If n is equal to two here, and it certainly is, we'd get two minus one all over two. Uh, so negative one squared is a positive one. You'd say, wow, would you look at that? You just have one half. And then we'll take negative one to the third. But this is where n is equal to 3, so we'd get 3 minus 1 all over a 3. You'd say, well, wow, would you look at that? We'd get negative, because negative 1 to the odd power is negative. Say negative 2 thirds. Say, look at that. Fourth term. Well, we'd get negative 1 to the fourth. Then we'd have 4 minus 1 all over 4. Pardon me. And this would be a positive three-fourths. Hey, look at that. Tenth term, look at this. You can just jump straight to that tenth term. It's kind of nice that you can do that. Think pretty quickly. You can see that it's a positive nine-tenths. So that's just getting us started with writing out the sequence that we are given, seeing the pattern. Are we doing okay? Okay, so these were all explicit forms. What we're about to do is go to recursively defined sequences. Recursively defined sequences uh, will give us a formula where we will have to refer back to at least one previous term. In other words, if I want to know the seventh term, Chances are I'll need to know the sixth term or the fifth term or both, something like that. Uh, so you can see this isn't maybe quite as pleasant. Getting up to the tenth term, we're going to have to build up. Uh, but look at this. They're telling us nicely that the first term here is 7, right? And then a sub k plus 1 is 2 thirds times a sub k. So, you know, a sub 1, that's no big deal. You'd say, how do I find a sub 2, though? Well, this is the type of thinking that you're going to have to have. Look at this, a sub k plus 1, and here's your a sub k. If you want to let a sub k plus 1 represent 2, you're saying k plus 1 would equal 2. That means k itself would be 1. So this would be 2 thirds times a to the first. In other words, and I want to even highlight this even a little bit more right here and here, to get your term, the k plus 1 term, you have to go backwards to the previous term and then multiply it by 2 thirds. That's what that formula is really saying. Uh, so we'll say 2 thirds times a sub 1. You'd say, well, what is a sub 1? We just found that. It was 2 thirds times 7 and we'd get 14 thirds. You'd say, well, how do I find a sub 3? Well, according to this pattern, that's going to be 2 thirds times a sub 2, right? Because whatever term I'm looking at, I need to go to the one right before it. That's the relationship between k plus 1 and k. k is the term right before it. Uh, and you could say, well, I just found that this term right here is 14 thirds. And when I multiply them together, I'll get 28 over 9. Yeah. Finally, you go up to a sub 4. You'll say, well, that means I have to go 2 thirds times a sub 3. Wow. So I'll go 2 thirds times that 28 over 9. I'd get 56 over 27. 
and then we are done. So guys, actually that is known as a recursive setup. You will be given some information on recursively defined sequences. You'll be given some problems like that. Most of the time, thank goodness, we will have explicit forms. Okay? Uh, what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about what it actually means for a sequence to converge. And we're going to use that word a lot. Many sequences have the property that as n gets larger and larger, you might not be surprised as n approaches infinity, a sub n gets very close to L, and L is a real number. In other words, the difference between your nth term and that actual number L in absolute value, you, you could say as I subtract, I don't care if it's a positive subtraction or a negative subtraction, just take the absolute value, think about it as a, a positive value then, that subtraction would be getting close to zero. By the way, the difference between them you are really saying. That, another word for subtraction is difference, isn't it? You can say the difference between those two numbers is getting close to zero. Well, how do we say that in a more complicated way, in a more mathematically precise way? Here's a sequence. We're going to say it has a limit. L, or it converges to L, if for every epsilon, this is the Greek letter epsilon, for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists some term, we'll call it capital N, uh, such that the difference between your term and L is smaller than epsilon whenever the term is greater than N, capital N. And if such a number L does not exist, the sequence diverges. Now, right there, that can seem awfully confusing, but this is very rigorous mathematics. And I'd like to help you out reviewing a little bit about solving this. This is going back to Algebra 2. So this is not calculus, this is just Algebra 2. You might remember in Algebra 2 when you were solving an absolute value inequality, absolute value less than something. Uh, case in point, like if I gave you just the absolute value of x is less than 3, tell me about the number line that we'd be seeing here. We'd definitely be going between 3 and negative 3, wouldn't we? You're saying, give me all the numbers whose distance from zero is less than three. We'd get something like that. What's another way of writing it? X is between negative three and three. This is what I'm going to write right here. Maybe your Algebra 2 teacher told you less than, less and, or sandwich. Right? So that's what this absolute value is really doing. Just some Algebra 2 review. You can think, well, what's this really saying? Well, now I can solve. I can add an L to both sides. And I'd have A sub N is less than L plus epsilon. A sub N is equal to L minus epsilon. And right there, that can look very strange, but this might help you understand convergence in a very different way. Here's what we're saying, guys. I could graph... Uh, you know, the terms of a sequence with ordered pairs. We talked about that up above. And what you'd expect is, as you were plotting some dots, you know, representing the term numbers, you'd think, ooh, I should be getting close to L. I should be getting close to that limit. You can say, well, what exactly does that mean? It means that you will be between L plus epsilon and L minus epsilon. That's what it means, really, to arrive at a limit. You will always be within that bandwidth. Somebody would say, well, how small is epsilon? Answer, as small as anybody would want. You could say, hey, I bet you you can't get within 0.00001. If you've got that limit, you will. 
It's a new way of looking at convergence. 